Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our session visualizing InfluxDB 2.0 dashboards. Um, let me start with a quick disclaimer. So, all projects mentioned in this presentation are not officially supported by Influx Data. However, all of them are open source, and source code for them is mentioned in our slides and is available on GitHub or GitLab. We also have a page with all of uh, with all of the links mentioned, so it's easy to take a look at each of the projects. However, there, there's something that Rick and I have been working on and not official projects. So let me start by quickly introducing myself. My name is Wojciech Kotian. Uh, I'm an engineer at Influx Data. Uh, I have over 10 years of experience with public clouds and multiple years of experience with Kubernetes. However, this talk is about something slightly different. So I'm, an, I'm working on, uh, at Influx Data uh, around Cloud2, and I've been experimenting with some of the APIs around it, and this is this is close to what my experience is. Rick? Uh, hi, my name is Rick. I'm the head of the platform team at Influx Data, and I've been writing open source code and uh, leading open source projects for like a lot of years. So. Um, I uh, have a big interest in Kubernetes and cloud computing, but I also really enjoy application development. Okay, thanks, Rick. So I think the key takeaway that we want everyone to remember is dashboards are exposed via API, meaning that the dashboards can be used by, by way more than just viewing them in the InfluxDB web UI. I think this is something not a lot of people realize, and this this talks about it in more details. So basically dashboards and their cells are a way of defining views. Uh, however, they're generic enough that it allows people to show most information in a visual way and uh, they, can, they, can, they can be used to define how the data should be shown. That's quite obvious when you think about the InfluxDB UI. But importantly, in, InfluxDB 2.0 has a complete API for dashboards and cells. So you can get all the dashboards and then list all the cells in the dashboards. You can use labels to find your dashboards. It's also possible to modify the dashboards via the API. It's out of scope of this project and there's a small caveat that if you, if you edit it in a way that the UI or the tooling you're working on doesn't support it properly, you may, you may be experiencing interesting features of the, of, of the tools that will be showing them. Um, right, so let's talk about some other use cases that, that we thought of. So as, as I said, like dashboards are pretty generic, so it's definitely possible to use the same definitions for other things. So for example, you could be building a not so sophisticated alerting system based on dashboards and cells. One simple idea that uh, is easy to implement is it could be used on color definitions or additional columns so a uh, cell could report whether it's okay or not okay, or we could just use the configuration of a cell and which color it should be shown as, as an indication of, of, of an issue. I think the, the interesting aspect of it is it unifies what is shown and what is monitored, meaning if you change your query in a dashboard, it automatically would affect your alerting system. So you wouldn't have this requirement of editing, editing it in multiple places or managing it in multiple places. Also, it's possible to define a view that will be shown in multiple types of applications. So like a website, a mobile application, and industrial status boards that a lot of large companies use. And it's also, this makes it easier to manage same views across different types of solutions. So if you would be building a similar solution from scratch, you would have to somehow manage all of the views, make sure that they're consistent across the board. If you standardize on a dashboard API, you get that out of the box and you have a pretty nice UI provided by the InfluxDB 2.0. It's also possible to do domain specific extensions uh, or definitions. So for example, one, exam one thing that I've done in one of the projects we're going to be talking about is I wanted to form format date time specifically. So I, I made it that if you return a specific column and the value is at date time, you can specify the formatting to STRF, STRF time function. Um, other example could be displaying custom messages in, in, 
on top of numeric values. So for example, you could return a one or a zero as a status, but then you may actually, your custom code may actually render it as a yes or a no. And then you could implement your own display mode. So for example, OHLC would stand for open, high, low, close, and it's often used in financial data. InfluxDB UI doesn't provide that, that visualization yet, but if you would extract all four values using InfluxDB function, functions and aggregate windows, you should be able to render it. So if you implement something on top of a dashboard that renders this kind of view, it should be definitely doable as, some, as long as you export the appropriate values. Right, so, um, so two things Rick and I focused was around visualizing dashboards outside of InfluxDB UI, and that's specific use cases of what we just talked about. So one thing is around uh, rendering dashboards as images. So for example, you have your dashboard and now you want to generate an image from that. I think this has been something that a lot of us have wanted for a long time. Um, we've tried to implement it so that it, it has configurable inputs and outputs. So you can specify the time range, the image resolution, DPI, whether it's light or dark mode and uh, some other functionality. And some of the interesting use cases. So as I mentioned, showing it on e-ink displays, it works quite well on, on an e-ink display actually. Showing it on TVs, which is basically the same, but some TVs don't have a browser. So it would be more convenient to just have it run, show an image, or you could also just hook in a Raspberry Pi and just have that image rendered on that, on that Raspberry Pi. Another interesting example is you could send it along with your alert notifications. So for example, when something's wrong, instead of having people go to your dashboards, you can just send the status as it was at the time of the alert on via email, on Slack, Microsoft Teams, whatever your means of communication is. And this has the upside that you get a snapshot of what the status was at the time of the alert. So if things go back to normal a few minutes later, you will still be able to see what the issue was at that time without having to go back in time and trying to render the dashboard. Another project we, we, we were working on and have done is uh, an SDK for mobile applications that's called Flux Mobile. It's built using Dart and Flutter and supports iOS and Android. So as I said, it's a framework that allows us to show dashboards from InfluxDB inside your application. So it's meant not as a, not as a standalone application, although we do have some examples, but you can put it inside your applications and make it easier to just embed a few views from InfluxDB. And we, as I mentioned, we have multiple examples. I think we just ran out of the box and Rick will demo some of those examples in, in an emulator in, in, in a while. So what we wanted to do and actually did is render a subset of dashboards on multiple types of devices. We have some examples here. We can render an image to a, to, to a large screen TV. We can show it on an e-ink display, which is what is shown on the left. And that's, a, that's an actual photo of, a, of an e-ink display, of a 10-inch display, and a phone or a tablet using the, the mobile application. And some of the ideas we have for the future, the one to use Giraffe, which is a JavaScript framework that, that, that Infect Data has created and used that as foundation for the visualization instead of writing our own code for, for rendering the specific cells. So this would allow us to render uh, basically all of the all of the different types of cells and supporting that is quite difficult. So if we use Giraffe, that would be built in and it would be visualized in exactly the same way as the browser. So then the next step would be to, ren to render it in a, in a headless browser instead of the rendering code that we have today. So we could just render it in a browser, take a screenshot of that, for possibly supporting all exactly the same set of options that we have today you just that the output image would be slightly different. And then for mobile applications, we could just embed a web browser or basically a web view and just embed Giraffe with all of the, with all of the required files and dependencies and just pass the data from InfluxDB to it and visualize it in the same way. So this way it would be more streamlined, more similar to what the InfluxDB user interface experiences and also easier for us to maintain, but that's, these are the plans for the future. Right, so the first project that we want to talk about is the InfluxDB dashboard renderer. Um, so the goal was to basically take 
dashboards and be able to render them as, as images and show them as closely as possible and show a relatively large subset of those dashboards. But also uh, one, of the, one of the interesting things is we, are, uh, we also wanted it to be supporting different display types, meaning that for some display types, the image has to be rendered in a slightly different way. So this is, an, this is a, as I mentioned, this is a photo of a 10 inch e-ink display that I have at home and I render, I actually render a pretty similar dashboard there right now that tells me the time, that tells me the air quality at my house and some other things that, that I want to see when I, when I wake up and I want to see what, what's happening today. Um, right, so project and goals. So as I mentioned, the goal is to render a subset of InfluxDB dashboards as images. So not all cell types are supported, uh, but a large subset of those cells are supported. So for a lot of dashboards, all that is needed is just, just to point that tool at the dashboard and it, it will render it. It will output an image, a PNG image, and it's written in Python, it's published in GitHub. All of the links will come in later. There's also a Docker image that I will show in a second. And uh, right, so it, as I mentioned, it began as a weekend project. So I got an e-ink display some time ago and I thought it would be really nice if I could just continuously show some status there. And I thought, I'm working on, I'm working on this time series database. I pushed so much of my data in there. The only thing I wanted was basically to, to see the current time because I thought, thought this would be a nice way to show that. But then I realized I can also show some of the additional things like the air quality, which sometimes is not as good as I would want it to be. And it may be a hint for me to turn on the, uh, the, the air purifier. Well, as I, but then I realized that I can just make a more generic solution and this could be some sort of a weekend project for me and it evolved from a single weekend to multiple weekends. But basically now it's a web, after some iterations, it's now a set a Python library and also a web server that can be run out of the box. It can take inputs and it can render the dashboards by just pointing it to it or using the label to find it. So the code is on GitHub. Uh, the image is published on Docker Hub. There, there will be links later on. It supports variables, so we can pass variables as inputs. So if your dashboard currently uses some variables to make it customizable, it's possible to pass it. It's possible to pass time range and window period. One important thing is, uh, because it's a long running process, it, it took me a while to make sure that we don't have any memory leaks and that that it doesn't crash after after some period of time. I've been I've been running DAO, that container image specifically for six months on a machine that I hardly ever reboot and I haven't seen any issues with memory spikes with it. So it run it renders as as I mentioned as, as a large subset of, of the dashboards, meaning that you may run into something that will not render properly, but in most cases it will. So it supports background and foreground colors and value ranges. So if your dashboard as this configured, uh, they will be rendered properly. Dark and light mode, meaning that you can render it in a dark background, light background. Uh, DPI settings, that was specifically for e-ink displays because they're usually high resolution, but uh, but the screen is, is, is smaller than your TV would be. And then multiple queries and multiple tables in the output are also supported. So it supports single stat, graph, graph and single stat and, and the gauge cell types and right future plans. So it doesn't support some of the, some of the cells, especially heat map, histogram, scatter table and node. I've implementing some of these is, is trivial. Implementing some of them is more complex. So I'm not sure what the order of these would be, but my goal is to improve the support for that. And also uh, it's missing labels for horizontal axis. So that, that is something I need to work on and will be coming soon. And also improving the performance for large dashboards by running some of the queries in parallel. That would help in renderings of the larger dashboards, but just as it stands today, if your queries are fast, you would not even see the issue. And right, and improve subset, support for subset of colors. So one of the things I wanted to support is being displays and they have a limited set of colors that they support. So Grayscale being displays are relatively simple. 
to manage, but there are also color displays which are necessary for the subset of the RGB space. So there may be some optimizations there to figure out coloring scheme that matches what the ink can output. But this is specifically for inks and I, I'm not really sure how easy or difficult that would be. And also I would need to get an ink to support that. So let's, um, right, so the technology stack. Uh, it, it, it runs on Python 3, so there is no issue with Python 2. And it's cross-platform, I've tested it on multiple, uh, on multiple systems and I run it on Raspberry Pi as well. And it's, it's using Flask for rendering the images, but that's basically very simple code. Uh, for rendering, it uses Matplotlib, which is a, an excellent library and can render a lot, of, a lot of different types of data. And as I mentioned, there is a container image ready to run that, that can be used. So yes, so let me jump to a terminal so I can run it. I'm going to cheat a bit because I have the command line already here, but I'm going to explain what it does. So this will run the image that I published. It'll take my InfluxDB token. I'm pointing it on, actually, let me sh show what I'm pointing it to. So this is my account in InfluxDB Cloud, uh, in, and this is my organization. So I'm telling the renderer, run it. And this is, by the way, this is my organization. This is my token, and this is what the, this is the URL of the, of my of my instance in FlexDB 2.0. It can talk to any type of, in, of InfluxDB tool. So it can talk to the open source, to cloud, and it, it doesn't really matter as, as long as it supports the same version to API that has the dashboard support. So I can run it. I can also mention in the meantime, the options. So the documentation on GitHub lists all of the options. So I could either specify all of the things I have provided as, as, a, as, a, as a query parameter to my, my renderer, or I could provide it as an environment variable when I run it. So for example, the way I've, the way I've done it is I don't have to pass anything like my, like the parameters to my cloud InfluxDB 2.0 connectivity. I can simply provide the label of my dashboard. So, I am for port forwarding it to port 5000, so I can go to localhost port 5000, render, and I can say, render my dashboard, and the dashboard has the label demo, and I can also say, render it, to basically fill all of my, all of my screen. It's going to take a while, a, a few seconds to render it. In the meantime, I'll show my, I show the original dashboard, so we can see I have a gauge here, I have some, some graphs. And we can now see that it's going to be pretty much the same dashboard. That code is basically making sure that it fits into the dimensions that I have entered here. So even if the dashboard is relatively, has, has, is relatively tall and has a large number of rows, it's going to squeeze it into the dimensions that are requested. So if your dashboard is not in this, is not in this, uh, you know, like if your dashboard is too, 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 too like it, it, you can adapt the size of your dashboard depending on how many, how many rows you have in, in, in there. But, okay, so we can all, what you can also do is, I've mentioned that I can control whether it's dark or, or, or light mode. In this case, the parameter name is bright. I think that should be changed. But like, what I could also do is I can say, render it in black and white, Form mode, which is what a lot of ink displays support. In this case, it only uses black, white, and two, two grayscale colors to render everything. And as I mentioned, this is what a lot of ink displays support with, uh, I mean, ink displays often support more, more varieties of colors, but with this specific render mode, the refresh of the ink display can be done without the blink, without the blinking effect. So. This helps rendering things in an ink display without having to do the full refresh, and it's possible to do an incremental refresh. Um, we can also, like I mentioned, I can also do it this way that I could render it. Uh, well, let's do it this way that I could render it much taller and and decrease the width, and we can see that it'll be different 
the, the proportions will be different. What's interesting is that the colors that I've defined in my dashboard are preserved. So let me just disable the black and white modes. But we will notice that the colors, for example, in the disk usage is preserved between the dashboard in InfluxDB and between here. And also if the gauge has just two colors and it should be a, grad a gradient that's also properly supported in this case. Um, right, so as I mentioned, the links will be provided later on, but the, the project has pretty extensive documentation on how to run it as a container, how to run it outside of the container as well. And it's also possible to do a post request. So if, especially if you don't want to pass the token as part of your URL, it's possible to do a post request, posting it as a JSON object. And, and there are additional parameters for things like start offset, end offset, window period. Offset unit is used when there's aggregation happening. And DPI can be used to make some of the text larger or smaller. So that's it for me. So let me turn back to slides and get back to the, the other project that we have. Okay, so Flux Mobile, take it away, Rick. All right, so um, this is more work that Wojciech and I worked on together. And this is also community open source code. We'll, we'll give you a link to the GitLab project when um, at the end of the slides, and I'm sure they'll be linked with wherever you're watching the video. So first, just a little overview on how we chose to support the um, mobile applications. So first of all, what you could do is you could use the, the container that we built um, with all the code for rendering that Wojciech wrote and just render out images that can be pretty easy to display on different mobile devices. But if you want to provide a more native interactive experience, we wrote a lot of code to make it easy to, to write a phone app or add to a phone app. So I think the next slide provides some background on what we chose uh, for that. So we use something called a flutter and which we'll explain a bit in a future slide. And so the idea is this is really an application framework. We don't have uh, an application at the moment that, um, that you can run standalone, but you can e very easily build whatever user experience that you want with the framework that we provided. So um, the idea was we're, we're using Wojciech's dashboard. Well, one of his dashboards for showing air quality. And then originally we were just thinking, let's just show one view of it. Um, and so originally we just wrote an application, but then over time, we ended up abstracting away parts of that application. And then we said, you know what, let's just make an SDK and then make it really easy to build this application and other applications with it. So the code is that, that is in the SDK, we know works for building the kind of applications that you want. Um, to go to the next slide, please. Okay, so just real quick, like what is Flutter? Um, what is Dart? So Flutter is a project for writing cross-platform applications that um, I'm a big fan of. Uh, I know it's not super mainstream, but again, this is community open source code. Um, but I really, if you're interested in writing mobile applications, I strongly recommend that you take a look. So there's two modes for running Dart. One is JVM based. Um, and this is really nice because if you're writing Dart lane code during the development process, there's a VM that gives you a really fast, like hot reloading and other things that make it really pleasant to um, develop in. But there's also a, another mode where the same code gets compiled down the machine code. 
So you can build very small binaries that are native to the platform that you're targeting. So what is Flutter? Flutter is a framework built on top of Dart that's made um, to make uh, very pleasing user experiences that you can then deliver to the various platforms that are supported. So one, one important thing just to stress is that this, this is not HTML. This is not an HTML framework. This is not applications that are just web applications that are trapped inside of a web view in a mobile application or real native applications. The primary support for Flutter right now is on iOS and Android, but there, um, there's also a web mode. So the same thing can be used in the web and they're working on uh, desktop support right now. So uh, when Flutter has reached maturity, it'll be a true multi-platform framework. Um, and that's one of the things I enjoy about working in it. So what's in our library? So we wrote a library called Flux Mobile. And the first it has like the API class that you would expect, right? A class where you can query and you can write and just do like basic interactions with the, with your instance of InfluxDB. So send it a query, write to it. But then we also have API classes for things like a query object, a table object, a row object, a point object. And then you can use all these to mix together to create very detailed custom user experiences as you wish. And like all the interaction with the uh, database is taken care of for you and you're giving very easy to use classes. But Additionally, we've provided a lot of GUI components for things like user management, dashboards, making line graphs, single stat cells, um, other, other objects that then are really useful for rapid application development. So you can um, really quickly put together a user experience uh, if, if you prefer to go that route. And I'll demo some of that in a moment so okay, I okay. Think oh it's demo time okay yes. so um so i just need to share my screen here select the desktop okay so what you're looking at here is my development environment and this here on the right where it says airqual home this is an application that i'm writing called airqual which lets you read um, from anywhere on the internet what your air quality sensors in your house is. And the way it works is it's actually communicating with Voidcheck's dashboard. So all the design work of doing the queries and uh, setting the colors, creating the graphs, all of that was done in the Influx, InfluxDB dashboard editor. And this, this just uh, presents it. So I want to walk through quickly. You can see here it just says dashboard. So the one piece of code I'm going to write is just one line to make the dashboard work. But let me just walk through the code real quick. So this is typical Flutter code. Um, I don't want to give a you know, tutorial on Flutter per se. I actually have tons of those in a different YouTube channel. You can let me know if you're interested. Um, but this shows that there's an API object. We have an object called persisted args, which is a really useful object because what we actually do, you need three pieces of information to interact with your influx DB instance. And we have functionality that actually saves that uh, securely on your mobile device, whether it's iOS or Android, that's all taken care of for you. Um, and then we have a dashboard object. Um, here. So there's a dashboard class that handles many, many things about dashboards for you. So um, the way the code works is that um, it wants to show a dashboard object here. Um, and, uh, but it's not initialized. So we need to initialize it. And we're going to always initialize in this refresh function. And so all we do here is we 
say that we want a list of dashboards. We're going to get those dashboards by calling the API, calling the dashboards function on the API. So there's a function just called dashboards that returns all your dashboards. Now, if you want to, you can pass in a label and the label I'm passing in is just a string called mobile. And what it'll do is it will look through all of your dashboards and only return dashboards that are lit that have the label mobile on it. So what Wojciech did was he designed a dashboard and then he put the mobile label on it. And then all I need to do in the refresh argument here is to set the dashboard to the first dashboard in that list. Right? So then this application, then every time you hit refresh, you'll have a new instance of the latest dashboard. Okay. So now, here what we're doing is when the application starts up or the view starts up is we create a, um, uh, a instance of persisted API args. What this does under the covers is tries to see if there's any API args already of, available uh, that are, are persisted in the user's secret score. And if there are, then it'll set the uh, setup argument here to be true. Okay. So then we try that. We call init user. It tries to load the args from storage. If it's set up, then I go ahead and initialize the API. Okay. Otherwise, just go ahead and then try to refresh. Okay. So, um, if we scroll down here, we can say that I added a um, action button, which is this user button, right? And you can see that all I did was say, I want to use an API args form. And this is something that's in our library. It's a form that you can use that will automatically just take your API args and then create the GUI for you. So if I click this user button here, it'll bring up a form. And you can see it's already filled in because I already used the, um, uh, I already ran the code and you can see that it read from this all the information that I need to get to uh, the dashboard. And it handles, you know, giving you a, a masked token string and everything. So that's all taken care of for you. So it's just, you don't have to, uh, invent your own user experience there if you don't want to. Okay. So now let's finish the application. We're not showing the dashboard. We just have this text called dashboard, which is pretty annoying, right? So what we want to do, first of all, is um, let's just get rid of this. And then I'm going to use a class that we have called InfluxDB dashboard list view. Okay, so we already wrote a function called a dashboard list view that takes a parameter called dashboard, right? And what is the dashboard? It's the dashboard that we set at the top. We already have that available. I'm going to auto format the code here. I'm going to hit save. And then you can see it went up. It found a dashboard that was tagged mobile and now it's rendering the dashboard that Wojciech designed in InfluxDB. And we can see right now his air quality measured by parts per million um, is uh, at 1.6. This is rendering a single stat cell. It's looking at what the background color is and setting the background color appropriately. So that's all handled for you. And then here you can see it's creating line graphs and each line graph is a different dashboard cell. It's showing the dashboard cell title. And one of the things that it handles for you is the interactivity. So if you click your finger on it, you can see that it actually shows the different uh, values at the different points in time. And so you have a true mobile, native mobile experience using the design work that Wojciech did up in InfluxDB on the dashboard. So that's really how easy it is to create a mobile application using your InfluxDB dashboards feature. So I'm going to stop sharing and we can finish off the slides.
That's Patrick. Right. So I believe there is only the last slide left, which is references and links. So uh, here we have all of the information and they will also be published along with the video, but the dashboard renderer is on GitHub and the image can, is available from Docker Hub. So you can just run, you, you, can, just, you can just pull it and run it. Uh, Flux Mobile is available on GitLab and you can also clone it and then uh, run the examples. It's all in the readme file. There's also an article on the new stack round using dashboards on Ink display, which is part of how the whole first project the dashboard renderer started. And I believe it's, it may be also interesting for people that would be curious about how we would be doing all of that. And also the part where it interacts with the Ink display itself and how do you, how do you display something on, on a physical device? I believe that was the last slide. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please reach out on, on, a, on a project. We're, op we're always open to new issues, new pull requests or merge yeah. requests in the case of GitLab. And thank you very much. Yep, really looking forward to hearing from uh, anyone who wants to join us uh, or who, who wants to use or contribute to these projects. Thanks everybody. Thank you, bye-bye.